So I get a lot of questions on the ferrocell and the hypertrochoid pattern that you see in uh, when you are looking at the north or the south pole under the ferrocells. So I thought I'd spend a, a little bit of time and um, try to maybe demystify that uh, a little bit to try to sort through where that pattern is coming from, what is the root of the pattern, and uh, then hopefully that will help us understand the uh, ferrocell a little better. So here I was playing around with the ferrocell. Um, as you can see, it's got lights uh, that go in a circle around the um, perimeter of the uh, lens that is in this uh, light box here. And so I was playing around with this magnet and I happened to have a white piece of paper underneath. Uh, normally I would use black because you want to try to see the lights and, and not what's, you know, not the reflections, but I wanted to see the, um, see what the light was doing. And so, um, here you can see the, you know, hypotrochoid pattern that is actually forming outside here. Um, the lights in fact are creating this effect and there are shadows because there is an object here and there is, you know, there's an object here. And so you've got sort of constructive and destructive interference uh, of the lighting out here and you see the hypertrochoid pattern. So here is the same setup, only I took out the magnet. I took out the magnet. This is the, the piece of paper. I drew a circle on the piece of paper where the, you know, where the, uh, where I want to place the magnet. Um, and so you can see that even without the magnet, uh, the lights are creating, although it's much more subtle, it's much more subtle when I took the magnet away, but you can still see the flowery, um, pattern forming on the outside here. Here they are, uh, the two pictures side by side. So you can see um, the, with the magnet there that the, the shadows are much more, are much stronger. You can see the pattern much better. And when I took the magnet away, you can see that the pattern's still there and it's uh, pretty much the same pattern, um, but the, um, it's just not as uh, bright. The, it's, the contrast isn't as high, but the pattern is definitely still there. So next I took a, um, I took, um, actually it was my bottle of Advil, but I was, uh, I, I took an object that it was approximately the same size and shape as the, uh, the magnets that I was using and I placed it, um, under the ferrocell and you can see there again, you can see the, the strong signal. Uh, this is now creating a shadow. So the shadow before of the one with the magnet was uh, an artifact of the fact that there's an object there and really had nothing to do with the magnet because here I have a, a um, medicine bottle that is creating a similar effect. It is, um, you know, creating shadows with light and dark regions here around that, hit, that give that, uh, you know, that flower of life effect. So uh, the flower of life effect, at least in these reflections, really has nothing to do with magnetism and has more to do with the configuration of the lights. So the next thing I did was I looked at, um, I blocked off all the lights and I looked at a single light source to try to see how the light was, um, was going into this lens or how the light is um, reflecting to our eyes, okay, from the lens. So the light starts here. Uh, it takes what look, seems like it takes one path this way and it takes seems like it takes one path this way. I don't know what it's actually doing. Um, but also uh, I noticed an artifact looking at it in real life. It was hard. To, it was easy to see, but it's hard to see in this image, but it looked like uh, this light was going to the top of the magnet and it looks like the this side is going to the bottom of the magnet and then it kind of streaks up like this so it, this it, it's this is much easier to see in 3d and I don't know if it's just the angle that I'm this magnet is it's probably not 100% normal uh, to the surface of the lens uh, so this is just a um, 
just an illusion because the, the lens itself, the ferrofluid between the two pieces of glass in the lens is very, very, very thin. And that is uh, the light is being created by this lens. Okay, it's the, the path of the light is um, going this way because of the lens. Okay, and then you can see over here, now you can look at each light and see that one is going this way and one is going this way. One is going this way and one is going this way. So each light source is producing two light paths. Okay, you can see this a little bit better here. Actually, that you can see that effect a little bit better here. Here's the light. And on this side, it looks like it's going to the top. And on this side, it looks like it's going to the bottom. And then it streaks up to the top. There's a, a light. It looks like it. it. It's obviously not doing that because this is the lens doing it. But this, it's like a hologram. It looks like it's 3D and it is taking a strange path. And when you look at it from the other side, here it looks like the light is go going to the top on this side. And it looks like it's going to the bottom on this side and then streaking up. The magnet that's what it looks like in real life and so um, th that's just an artifact that I noticed and I'm not really sure why it does that so here I have the magnet more um, normal to the surface of the lens it's more it's more straight and my camera is looking down more you know more straight down and so you don't see that artifact anymore the light looks like it's uh, going this way and then this way, or maybe it's doing an orbit. I'm not really sure. I'm not sure why it is bending like this, um, but this is an artifact of the lens. Something about this lens is making um, the light along this path and along this path um, light up. You have to remember the light, it has to get to our eyes. So the light both has to be taking this path and it has to be, um, you know, refracting, diffracting, or bending somehow to get to our eyes. So it's diffusing. It's diffusing to some extent, but these paths are getting lit up. So the question is, why does it do that? So uh, here is another view of um, one light source. Here is another picture of one light source with the light going this way and going this way. And the other thing, um, one thing that I notice in this image is the light, um, the color of the light changes as it go, gets towards the magnet. So uh, the color, it's blue here, and then it's going towards green, and then it looks a little red as it gets close to the, uh, the magnet. So the light is getting, the, the frequency of light is getting shifted as it gets closer to the magnet. At least that's what it looks like here. So there's a movie out there, an animation out there, that is um, an animation of Ken Wheeler's uncovering the missing secrets of magnetism. And so um, what this person did was, and I'm not even sure who it is, but um, I will leave a link in the description. What um, this video does is it, um, uh, uses Ken Wheeler's idea to try and um, animate some of the features of Ken Wheeler's um, missing secrets of magnetism, his model, um, which supposedly, supposedly explains the hypertrochoid pattern. So I highly recommend this video. Um, it is really very cool. There's some really good graphics in here. I'm, I'm always uh, interested to see really good graphics. And so... Um, but I want to point you to a part of the video, which is right around here. It's right around the 905 mark, uh, where he's showing these particles as they uh, travel around, uh, in and around the, the magnet. You could think of these as maybe charges flowing in and around the magnet. And those are the paths that they would be taking. It's basically a torus knot. It's exactly a torus knot, but when they turn it to this orientation, then you see the, the hypertrochoid pattern. And so 
um, this image here. I borrowed this image here in my next slide to show you um, the shape that we're getting from the single um, light source from inside a, a ferrocell or from a ferrocell image there is a cylinder magnet and you can see that the path that this light takes is um you know uh, identical to this path that um, the particles take in this animation and so i thought that was pretty neat um you know they match up you know almost exactly if not exactly and so uh, you know so this it's nice to kind of see these two images side by side you can see how close um, this really is to uh, what we see in reality so here we have a um, a cylinder magnet uh, there's I think there's actually two magnets in here so this is you know a cylinder magnet uh, with two magnets attached together uh, kind of like the stack stack of magnets here um, north uh, with north and south on either end here and so you can see how the light um, behaves with the magnet in this orientation and I also kind of noticed a couple of streaks down here I'm not really sure what that is but that was you know in the lens it was doing that and um, but the important point here is that the light source is here and the light um, comes from both sides and you can see the the shifting of the color as well from blue to green and eventually it would be it's a yellowish kind of color in here and you can see that in in this image which I got from um, from um, the US Ferrocell from Tim Van Raleigh's site I think that's where that picture came from or from one of his papers so I th yeah I think that's from one of his papers so here's uh, another paper of Tim Vanderelli's, or the paper that I got that image from, probably that's where it came from. Um, observing dynamical systems using magneto-controlled diffraction. And so the uh, main point that I want to make here is that the pattern that you see in the ferrocell is highly dependent on how you place the lights. How you place the lights. So you, when you place them in a circle, you get the hypertrochoid pattern. But if you place them in a line like this, then you get a different pattern. So this would be the North Pole or the South Pole. Um, this would be the, uh, the dielectric inertial plane would be uh, along here. And um, you can see that the pattern is quite a bit different than it was um, when the lights are in a circle. So the pattern that you see is highly dependent on the configuration of the lights right so um, i think that is you know very very important point uh, when you see the hypertrochoid you have to look at um, you know what's the configuration of the light how much of a role does the configuration of the light play okay how much does the um, configuration of the lights play in the hypertrochoid pattern that we see in the ferrocell. So that's the question. So here I have a, a single light source. Um, this is the dielectric inertial plane of the magnet. This is actually two magnets together where this is the North Pole, South Pole, North Pole, South Pole, or South Pole, North Pole, South Pole, North Pole, South Pole. Um, the point is that this is the dielectric inertial plane and you can see how the um, the light just goes straight down. This isn't perfectly aligned, but it goes straight down and it does, you see a little artifact on the other side as well. Um, I don't think, I think that's just um, one of the lights maybe from that I taped down uh, was leaking through. I think maybe that's what's going on here or because this was electrical tape, this light is reflecting here and some of this light is leaking back up. Um, but the point is that most of the light just goes to the um, dielectric plane and then stops or it looks almost looks like it's going around in real life but um, that's uh, neither here nor there you also see two streaks of light coming up from other either side and it looks like they you know want to meet up here it looks like they're trying to create a circuit here 
Uh, you can see it better over here. Here's a light. It's going straight in to the dielectric inertial plane of this, uh, these two magnets. And then you see these two streaks coming up here. So it's wanting to sort of loop around like that. So at least that's what it looks like. I don't know what it is actually doing. Um, that remains to be, to be seen. But uh, there's another streak down here. Again, I don't know if that's because there's some light down here reflecting from up here. But um, really this light is just going straight in to the dielectric inertial plane. There's no curvature going on um, in when you place the light right above the um, this inertial plane. Uh, so this uh, this is a, just a little little bit off topic, but um, in doing my experiments, I noticed that there was a difference between the uh, cylinder uh, magnet under the ferro cell and the ring magnet under the ferro cell. Um, what I noticed was uh, with the um, cylinder magnet, you've got a clear, you know, ferro-sized fer black hole in the middle surrounded by the um, the bending lights the hypertrochoid pattern from the lights uh, interacting with the ferrocell and here you see um, that there is a hypertrochoid pattern on the inside here uh, not so much on the outside um, but there is there is it's just a little bit of bigger scale and then there's just a little tiny black hole so there seem there seems to be something intrinsically different between the ring magnet and the cylinder magnet and so uh, interestingly um, I bought some magnets and they weren't advertised as cylinder magnets they were advertised as magnets with holes in them so here is one of those magnets uh, it is not a cylinder magnet it is a magnet with a hole in it so they when they made the magnet they made it solid and then they stamped a hole in it at least that's how uh, how I think that they were made and so um, basically what that means that it, when it was when the magnet was created it was not did not have the hole in it and then they punched the hole out and so you can see that under the ferro cell this looks a lot more like the cylinder magnet it it looks a lot more like the cylinder magnet and, and it's got you know this black hole and actually the interesting part is the um, this yellow line here is actually light reflecting off this edge here okay and so the black hole is actually a little bit um, extends outside of this uh, this whole region so uh, it's almost like the magnet doesn't know that the hole is there it's behaving as if the magnet um, it's behaving as if the ferro cell doesn't know that there's a hole there so um, I thought that was interesting I didn't I didn't really expect that but um, still I think that it is very interesting and so here's the two the cylinder magnet and the magnet with a hole in it um, the cylinder magnet is here and the black hole is here and the um, magnet with a hole in it it's a little bigger okay it's got a big black or sorry the hole is here the black hole extends outside of this hole and so let's see I think I have another view of these two uh, yeah so this is I think that this view is just, it's exactly the same so there's the cylinder magnet there's the black hole it's just the conditions are a little darker and this is not a ring magnet this is a magnet with a hole in it and a ring magnet will have a hypertrochoid porter um, uh, pattern on the outside a dark region as they're showing here although I think the ring magnet is actually on top of the ferro cell here which is why there's no pattern here but then you get this <coughs> excuse me hypertrochoid pattern on the inside with a little hole so there's definitely something different between the um, ring magnet and a magnet with a hole in it you can also see this when you look at the magnets um, using ferrofluid. And so here is a glass container. I have some ferrofluid 
in um, in the bottom here and when I put it on top of the magnet you see the um, these little pointy things coming up um, and uh, so that's what the cylinder magnet sorry that's what the cylinder magnet does the um, magnet with a hole in it okay also has it almost exactly the same pattern there's a cylinder magnet there's the magnet with a hole in it um, really it's very hard to tell a difference um, but here is the cylinder magnet okay when I put this on top of the cylinder magnet um, there are no pointy things in the hole region there's no pointy things in the hole region at least uh, the the ferro cell looks very thinned out um, in this region and you see the um, flowery pattern on the outside here and so there you know this uh, also demonstrates that there is something fundamentally different between a magnet with a hole in it and a magnet um, that was made a magnet when it had a hole in it so I'm actually not sure what's the difference between or, or how they make a ring magnet if anyone out there has any information on how they make a ring magnet compared to how they make a cylinder magnet I would be uh, really interested to hear about that I did a little bit of searching I didn't really dig too deep I'm sure I could find it if I really looked but if you have something that would be really helpful so here is an experiment I did I showed you in a previous video where I used a pole finder to investigate um, the magnet in this region in this region in this region in this region and in this region and as you may recall we get um, you know south in the middle north in the body and south on the outside and so let's have a look at that again we get it's south north south north and south so that's the behavior of the ring magnet now we're going to have a look at, look at the not a ring magnet this is the magnet that was made as a cylinder magnet with a hole punched into it and here you will see it is south on the outside north on the body north in the middle north on the body north on the outside and so this is not behaving now I'm trying to see if I can get a south reading in the hole but it doesn't seem to want to do it and so this behavior is um, different than the ring magnet this is not a ring ring magnet there is something significantly different between the um, ring magnet and the magnet with the hole in it so let's go back to the um, these uh, patterns that form on the north and south pole of magnets and see if uh, we can figure out whether this pattern uh, has anything to do with what we see under the ferrocell because there d does seem to be some similarities between the patterns that form um, in the ferrofluid and the pattern we see in the ferrocell. So we're just going to go through a few of these. Um, this is my very large magnet. This is my very large magnet, the biggest one I have. And so you can see um, the pattern that forms here. Now, um, someone asked me a question, like why do, you know, some of the images have big, um, big pointy things and some of the images have not so pointy things. And so the fluid that I used for my pictures, I had thinned out a little bit with some WD-40. Uh, when I was trying to make um, some ferro cells. So some of my ferro fluid got a little bit thinned out. And so it doesn't, um, the pointies don't stick up as much. If you have super pure uh, ferro fluid, I think you get, um, you get, you get uh, less number of pointies and the amplitude is much higher. So that's what it seems like anyways. And so uh, this fluid is a little bit thinned out and that's why you have like a lot of little pointy things. But uh, I couldn't help but notice how much the ferrofluid when you put it um, under a magnet, uh, how much it looks like the inside of a, um, an echinacea flower. Um, 
and also a sunflower. So uh, you do see sort of a similar texture. You see a, you know similar curvatures going on um, with uh, with what you see in nature. So I found that you know quite interesting. And so also um, here with my big magnet, I'm looking at the um, the dielectric inertial plane. And so here's where it gets really interesting because when you look at the inertial plane, the, the ferrofluid does not have any texture at all. It is smooth, it is um, clear, um, there are no jaggies. The jaggies are over here and over here at the north and south poles, um, but there is nothing in uh, this region here. And so for, you know, whatever that means, I don't know, but, um, Definitely, that's what you see when you look at this uh, this big magnet. And so here's another one of my magnets under the ferro under um, with fl ferrofluid um, in the bottom of a glass, and you can see it. You know, very very clear, shiny, uh, no texture at all in the middle, and then you see the uh, textures forming in the north or south pole. So I think it's possible that the these patterns that form with the ferrofluid um, have something to do with the hype with the hypotrochoid pattern in the ferro cell because the ferro cell is made with ferrofluid and even though as I, and it's very much thinned out so as I said I thin when I thinned out my ferrofluid um, there are you know the pointy there are more pointies pointy thingies and they are much smaller so you can imagine if you thin this out even more and more and more that you're still the patterns are still going to be there but they're going to be at the nano scale in the ferro cell and so here's an image that i found on the internet because i thought it was really quite pretty but it gives you the you know the sensation that is very you know thin in here not thin but there are no patterns it's very clear in here and the patterns form over here and over here so here is a picture of the ferro cell um, of a magnet under the ferro cell and this would be the dielectric inertial plane uh, along here and this is a similar view of a magnet the dielectric inertial plane here and so my contention was that these are um, these are isopotentials because they do seem to match the um, isopotentials uh, that you see in Michael Snyder's software. Um, so, you know, my contention was that this is, um, this is, uh, these are, the lines are following the isopotential paths. They're following isopotential paths. And of course, um, the path that the light takes is highly dependent on where the light source is. And so in this case, the light source is, uh, there are 36 lights around this ferro cell and so there's one light source one light source one light source and you can see that um, if they uh, if the um, the light source is uh, going through this region here the light can follow the isopotential paths quite nicely because there is no interference there's no uh, constructive and destructive interference or whatever it is that's causing these spiky things the spiky things are over here and that's why when you look over here in the ferro cell, you begin to see the, you know, the essence of the hypertrochoid pattern. You can see it in here and in here, um, but you don't see it here. So, um, so my hypothesis that the, the lights are following the um, isopotentials, uh, this explains why they can follow the isopotentials in this view. But then when you get back to the, um, to the ferro cell, when you get back to the ferro cell, uh, when you get back to the north and south pole in the ferro cell, then um, they tend to take then those constructive and destructive interference patterns caused by the ferro fluid, which is in the ferro cell, uh, might be responsible for uh, the path that the light takes in the ferro cell when you're looking at from the north and south pole. So um, that is pretty much everything I wanted to say. Um, 
I've got a few more slides here. So I want to, you know, emphasize the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm saying that it's possible that the, um, the way that the ferrofluid self, self organizes uh, when you place the North Pole or South Pole uh, against the ferro cell, um, this kind of pattern might be what is responsible for uh, this particular pattern. And so, again, this picture kind of shows um, the virtual path, the path from the animation that someone made of um, Ken Wheeler's Missing Secrets of Magnetism. And um, so that, I highly recommend that you watch that video because the animations are great and it will give you a real sense for um, how um, this hypertrochoid pattern could possibly be um, a result of the, uh, the ferrofluid. And so that is that. That was what my um, teaser video was about that I put out yesterday. And I've been wanting to put this out for a long time, but then I got kind of hooked on the um, I got kind of hooked on the relativity bend, but um, and I'm still working on that, so I will be back with that as well. But I thought I would like to get this out before the end of the weekend, and uh, um, and that's it. Ciao for now.